Well, my story is uh, a mixed marriage, lovely term. Um, father baptised Catholic, mother Presbyterian. When they uh, marry, my father's Catholic uh, relatives stand outside the church to which my mother's Protestant Presbyterian relatives never forgive them, really. Um, so uh, uh, at least in the immediate family, my father has his own experience of uh, a born-again experience and uh, uh, we attend a Baptist church, the closest church. They don't have a car. We're Baptist because again, of geographical uh, distance. So a lot of accidents on the story here. Um, grow up in a Baptist uh, church uh, in what's known as the Bible Belt of Melbourne. Um, in fact, it's the buckle of the Bible Belt. There are so many uh, Baptists and, uh, and evangelicals in that area. Um, it's a church experience that uh, is rich, that uh, trains us as family members in uh, presenting and speaking and engaging and serving. So um, a strong emphasis on um, being able to declare your faith and explain it uh, and an expectation of walking that faith. Um, so my journey really is uh, within, if you like, a little bubble of um, evangelicalism, Baptist evangelicalism within, within Melbourne. He has to go to a Presbyterian church to play cricket with the Presbyterian Cricket Club. And um, for a baptised Catholic, that's the first uh, major threshold to cross. Um, he uh, has a nominal faith. He hears a message that uh, uh, sees him have a real experience of um, transcendence, God, a personal God who loves him. He becomes... Um, an evangelical. And then he ends up uh, training himself, uh, he becomes a teacher, but training himself to be a, a lay preacher. So he, in his own way, uh, outside school hours, was um, a preacher taking services. So uh, there's, a, there's a journey from one side of the tracks to the other. Uh, given, you know, the 40s and 50s sectarianism and deep antagonism between Catholic and Protestants, that's an interesting journey. Did he ever share the details of that transcendent experience? Yeah, he talks about um, it being emotional, personal, moving, um, that uh, church wasn't simply a cultural thing, but it was a deeply um, a resting thing for him that he would have against his nominal uh, religious background um, a sense that it is now the most important thing in the world, that... Uh, uh, daily Bible reading and prayer becomes um, a pattern, a ritual, a, a commitment for him. And talking about his faith to friends becomes an outworking of that. So um, it, it turned his life around and there, therefore, I guess, our family lives around because of that experience he had. But, for example, where was he and what happened? Uh, well, all I know is there was a Presbyterian service where the cricketers had to attend and someone preached a sermon that uh, uh, grabbed hold of him. And uh, that church had um, a very devout, pious uh, woman, a Miss Giddings, who uh, took him and some of those who had had that experience in that service into a Bible class and personally taught them. Uh, those people in that Bible class became his best friends, so um, his social and personal and spiritual orientation all changed. My earliest memory is uh, a, a Christmas nativity play. I don't know if I was three, maybe four, I'm not sure. And just being overwhelmed, it was outdoors, summer in Australia for Christmas. And uh, it was uh, people as angels, choir singing, um, the nativity scene and wise men and uh, the safety and love of family. And I just remember being overwhelmed and thinking, so this is, this is God. This is what we're here for. This is magical. This is marvellous. So, yeah, that was my first experience and memory. What did you, 
what happened as a result of that? Well, that's my first memory. Uh, for us, uh, Sunday school, Christian endeavour, church, twice on a Sunday uh, was the norm. Uh, Sunday lunches we were always uh, discussing, you know, what the preacher had said and what it meant for us. So it was um, a family that uh, saw me incrementally, I guess, enculturated into this is my story too, this is what I believe, this is who I am. Um, and uh, being an evangelical family, my father at some age, I forget which, would have uh, knelt with me because we'd say our prayers each night and talked about the importance of faith um, being personal, asking Christ into my life. I have vague recollections of that. But uh, unlike his experience, which was coming from a very nominal, non-church-going, as they were, family, uh, cultural, Catholic, but almost agnostic, I guess you'd say, background, into a dramatic uh, experience of personal faith. Mine was, um, it culturally crept up on me. It just was what the family did. Tell me about your own faith, you know, as in faith, not religion. Tell me about your own, your own journey, <coughs> like... Uh... Yeah. Um, it was, I think, a struggle in my adolescent years between uh, what was expected of me as a Christian in a fairly devout family and um, what adolescents who normally act out need to define themselves over and against family. So I had a fair bit of personal tension and struggle around that. Um, it was resolved in one sense experientially for me in my last year of school. I was 17. I was at a retreat camp for um, people who were leaders of Christian groups. And I would have to say that struggle was resolved by what I'd describe as a numinous experience. I remember uh, in this camp that went over five days um, an experience of physically shaking, of feeling um, overawed by God, by uh, the otherness of God, by a sense that um, this was no longer head stuff but personal. And that for me resolved the tension of saying, you know, it's what my family expects, I'm going through the motions but there's nothing that I've really experienced that uh, legitimates this, these words, these rituals. So that camp um, really did turn me around. I, I, from that point on, had a um, much stronger sense of God with me, of this being authentic, of it uh, aligning experientially with certain words, categories that were doctrinal. So tell me, tell me about that experience. What, what exactly happened? What do you um, think? I, I remember being in it was sort of like a little coffee shop we had at the camp and um, I physically started shaking and I walked out and it was night, dark at night, in the bush and a strong, almost blanket-like uh, enveloping of me um, that... Uh, soothed the shaking, uh, gave me a sense of calm, um, a sense that God was there, real, personal, was with me. So what happened after the camp? I became much more uh, engaged with my faith. <laughs> um, I uh, uh, took on leadership roles that, you know, once before I was doing out of family duty, but actually had um, uh, energy now, uh, an interest. And I started reading my Bible, which I was made to do because that was what we did, uh, with actual real curiosity and trying to make sense of it and put together, you know, what God's purpose for the world was, what his purpose for me was, how I would prepare now to um, uh, really try and discern that and live by it and understand it. So, um, yeah, it was um, an energy and uh, an alignment, I guess. Tell 
What was the first time you would say in your life you had to rely upon God or chose to rely upon God? First time. Um, look, I, I uh, would have said prayers before that experience and said I was relying on God. I think after that, um, it was probably uh, the question of a young woman, now my wife, who I had met at that camp. That was the first time I'd met her. So that, that might give psychologists some, uh, some connection between the shaking and uh, love and spirituality. However, we didn't start going out till some time afterwards. And um, coming from a background where it was uh, no sex before marriage, it was uh, uh, trying to work out who your life's partner was and did God have a one and how did you prosecute that and go about it. I think that was the first time I relied on God. It was um, asking uh, her out, um, thinking, is this in God's will? Is this... Uh, um, just, you know, experimentation and fun, am I serious? Um, so uh, I think that's probably the first time uh, I thought about that. We ended up going out for seven years. We broke off seven times. She broke off it. She broke it off every time. Uh, I was either too shallow or not serious enough. In the end, I resolved this by asking her to marry me, and she said yes, and we got married, and we're still together 30 years on. But um, in, those, uh, in those years, I think that was probably the, uh, uh, the first time I think about uh, relying on God. How did that answer come to you? Uh, a Bible verse, uh, um, which was the way we looked then for God's guidance. So, I'm reading a, a verse from Paul's letter to the Philippians, which says, be of the same mind. She had come to the decision that, yep, we should get married. She's the one who'd broken it off all the time. <laughs> now, I was the one with cold feet, you know, married, 23, my goodness. So uh, I prayed, I asked God for a Bible verse, that Bible verse, be make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Now. You could read those words any sort of way. I read them saying, ah, this is the, the instruction from God that um, we're to get married. So that was, that was it. I had the Bible verse. I said, yep, okay, we were all right, because we talked about it. And uh, as I say, 30 years later, we're still married. Tell me about a time you doubted your faith. Yeah. I, um, I was the mayor of a city down here, St Kilda, which has um, it's a catchment area for mentally ill, homeless, street prostitutes, drugs. Um, and I was the Baptist minister by now. I was also running a legal practice. I was a lawyer minister, so I've had an unusual journey. And as mayor, um, I remember standing up for some of the sex workers who the police, you know, were getting freebies from, otherwise they would charge them. Some had been murdered, some were being assaulted. The attitude was, well, they're outside the law, they bring it on themselves. And I remember uh, standing up for them and asking a question, which is unusual for a Baptist minister, I guess, though I was a mayor, should we look at decriminalising street prostitution to at least give these women protection? I suffered a torrent of abuse from Christians uh, saying how dare I lower community standards and compromise God's holiness, Christian faith. And uh, I remember thinking the church is just full of judgment. Um, you know, my reading of the Gospels was Jesus actually met, mixed, celebrated even with women like that in his time. And um, I had at that time an offer to go into the Australian Senate, um, which meant I could break away from being both a Baptist minister and that institutional church. And I remember thinking, great, I'm going to cut these ties. I'm out of here. Um, and uh, I spoke at one Easter rally reluctantly. Uh, it was a Christian march through the city and I'm thinking, you know, these are probably fine people, but they still belong to this institution, the church that's 
for judgment and I'm over it. And I remember at this Easter rally being introduced generously, you know, you stood up for sex workers, the church gave you a hammering, we Christians here applaud you. This is actually what the gospel is about. You're one of us, you speak for us. And I remember this feeling of I was sort of over the church, maybe even my faith. I hadn't worked out if it was a faith God crisis or just an institution crisis, but, you know, those two things are hard to do discriminate often when you're in it. And suddenly this sense of these people are still my mob and their, their commitment, their courage, their faith to stand against the things that, you know, uh, had been I'd experienced only as judgmental, I can work with and I belong here. I chose not to go into the Senate. I chose to go back to ministry. It was uh, a real crossroads there and... There was uh, probably faith crisis mixed up, mixed up certainly with great anger at uh, the church, the institution. Um, so that was one moment. What's been your journey since then? Um, look, since then I think I've reformulated and refound my faith. Um, I uh, have uh, started to because of that experience I was describing, go deeper, understand that, um, you know, the purpose of faith is uh, transformation and it's for the big things, the tough things. It's for climate change. It's for poverty. It's for dealing with greed in markets. Um, it's also personal. It's for my how I choose to... Uh, believe I'm not just a biological freak in a cosmic zoo, that I'm here for a reason, that there is a destiny. And that reformulating has given me, again, new energy. So um, the old formulations that came to a crisis when I was mayor of St Kilda had been essentially, you know, the task is to go around telling people to become Christians and to go to church. And isn't that what Jesus did? Well, actually, no, it's not what he did. Um, his, uh, his announcement of hope, kingdom of God, was to challenge the big things in his day and, uh, if you like, to set the world right. You know, the, the, the Lord's Prayer that I reflect on and the Beatitudes have now become the centre of my faith. And, and one translation of uh, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, is set the world right. It's actually for the big things. That's given me a whole new energy. That's... Uh, a God involved in history, in the struggle against everything that cripples humanity, cripples the image of God, which is why I work for World Vision. Um, dirty water, not having enough food, not having access to medicines, cripples the image of God. You know, that's what I call sin. And salvation is everything that restores that crippled image. Clean water, enough food, having justice. Um, and now I've been able to, I think in my faith, walk that personally and start to understand what the task is uh, in terms of that personal faith engaging uh, in the world. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's been the resolution for me. So you went back into ministry at that crossroads and then how did you... What was the transition from ministry to World Vision? Well, I went back. I started uh, a thing called Urban Seed here in Collins Street, Melbourne, that fed <clears throat> hungry, mentally ill, homeless. We had a drug detox centre. So I engaged my faith in practical ways. For me, if God isn't involved here and now, I'm not sure where God is. Um, whilst I have some very good devotional, spiritual moments, if they aren't actually connected to... Uh, setting the world right, um, I start to get lost again. Um, world Vision literally tapped me on the shoulder. They, as a Christian development organisation, they said, uh, you know, your profile, I developed a bit of a public profile, um, can help Australians understand that there is a task to do for the world's poor and it involves some transformation for them as donors and the journey of partnership, not just charity. 
So um, I considered it and uh, accepted. So I've been the CEO of World Vision, um, having left uh, Irvine Seed and the, uh, the Collins Street Baptist Church here where I was the minister some six years ago. Tell me about somebody who you admire for their faith. Um, I named my youngest son Martin after Martin Luther King. Uh, his uh, uh, commitment to a God of justice as a Baptist minister, obviously an Afro-American, was very attractive for, and, and shaping of me going into the Baptist ministry. And um, the ethic that he preached, you know, we will absorb your capacity to hate us with our capacity to love you, um, was an ethic that I, th I believe went right to the heart of faith for me. Um, so Martin Luther King has you know, rev read all his writings and know his speeches off by heart. Um, uh, he's been one who's been a, a guide and an inspiration. Um, there are many others. Uh, Desmond Tutu is one for me. Um, the sheer courage of standing up against um, religious apartheid that uh, had a theology of a separate heaven, even for blacks and whites. Um, extraordinary understanding of both faith and, and courage. They're the sorts of heroes I have. I just uh, happened upon, in the past month or two, uh, Dr. King's uh, sermon, The Drum Major Instinct. Unbelievable. Un unbelievable. And, and what is extraordinary is that, uh, what, he died in 68, so that's 40 years, 41 years. They still have the same cultural breakthrough, just the power of that. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. When you go to the King Center website, they actually have his voice uh, reciting that part of the sermon, you know, uh, you know, anybody can lead because anyone can serve. Yeah. You know, you don't need to subject and your predicate don't need to agree to serve. <laughs> you know, the second yeah. degree of thermodynamics to yeah. serve. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that wonderful? It's beyond wonderful. Yeah. I'm actually taking my work team to Atlanta for an off-site, and we're going to meet with his niece. Great. Uh, who's a minister, Dr. L. Peter King. Great. Well, you know, the last uh, sermon he preached before he was assassinated, talk about the prophetic vision. You know, I've been to the mountaintop. Longevity, it has its, uh, its uses. I, like anyone, would like to live a long time, but I may not get there. But I've seen the promised land, and as a people, we'll get there. And next day, he's assassinated. I mean, you just watch it with tears in your eyes going, wow, it's amazing. Mm. I'm most grateful for this winning first prize in the great lottery of life that uh, I was born here, uh, where just by virtue of being thrown onto the stage called life here, universal health, universal education, um, a chance to be able to fulfil all my full potential has been possible for me. In my work from Mozambique to Congo to tsunami ravaged areas, you realise they drew last ticket in the lottery of life, you know, destiny and potential is set by virtue of where you're thrown up on this stage. And so I'm very, very grateful for that. My greatest wish is that I will be able to inspire uh, people and therefore out of the policies that understand a global ethic, you know, that the world is a waterbed. You press down here, it comes up here. So the issues of justice, of dealing with poverty, of dealing with climate change are now issues for a global village. And um, most of my um, agitating, speaking, organising is really around how we find a global ethic um, for, for this century. Well, I'm the husband of one wife. I've got three kids who uh, are great kids. Mind you, I applied to each of them to be their friend on Facebook and all three rejected me. When I asked why, they said that's parental stalking. 
Uh, so I'm not sure they always appreciate me, but uh, I think uh, uh, to, to have a marriage and a family and a base out of which you can project some of the things that you believe in, uh, in terms of your faith and your passion for, for, for life um, is, what, is what sums me up. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No. Thank you very much. Pleasure.